All right, so my sermon this morning is titled Halloween, Celebrating Death, Evil, and Fear. And as I mentioned in the announcements, I just want to preach on why uh, I believe that Christians ought not to be celebrating uh, the, hol- the, the holiday, the, the at least American holiday that's coming up of Halloween. Yeah. It's on October 31st. And before I even get into this, I just want to, you know, I guess outline a little bit of, of you know, especially if this is new, maybe it's the first time you're hearing this, is one, you know, and what we, we would try, what we try to do here at this church is take the Bible very seriously, right? Take the Word of God very seriously, our walk with God, the things that we do, uh, whatever we participate in, every aspect of our life, we really ought to be scrutinizing and, and becoming in conformity with the Word of God. So even if it may be a, a long-held tradition, things that people have done year after year after year after year, we want to still be able to examine those things and determine if if those are things that we should continue to do or if we should stop doing them does these things do the things that we do bring honor and glory unto the lord or do they not or are they just somewhere in between right we need we need to use discernment use judgment to determine this stuff and it's where we're starting off in the book of proverbs because while there's there's many things that the bible explicitly says that we should or shouldn't do there's also many more things that the bible is not explicitly telling you you can or cannot do something so like the word halloween isn't found anywhere in scripture it's not something that you're gonna be able to find be like thou shalt not participate in halloween or something i mean if it were it's really easy right so thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal thou shalt not commit adultery these are all very easy commands that you could just look at and be like man that is black and white there is no question about that the bible clearly says that but then there's other areas of our life uh, that that we need to just use a little bit more judgment a little bit more discernment and go to the bible and seek the wisdom from the word of god and make the necessary applications to our life so that we could make good judgment calls right so that we're not going to be displeasing to god because at the end of the day i don't know about you but I, i actually really do care if God is happy with what I'm doing or if I'm making God angry with what I'm doing. And unfortunately, there are many people through their own life that will make God angry and they may not even know it. It could be doing it ignorantly. And, And just because it's ignorant though, like I don't want to continue that way, right? I don't, I don't want to still be doing things in your heart. You can feel fine in your mind. You can say, well, I love God, but there are yet things that people can do that are still sinful, that are still wrong, and we should always be striving to learn, to understand more about the Bible, understand more about God and who he is, what makes God happy, and what makes God angry. So we start here in the book of Proverbs just to get a little bit of wisdom, because Proverbs has some real basic truths for life in general. This is, there's, there's less of the stories in Proverbs and, and a lot of just real simple basic truths that you could just find verse after verse after verse in this book. And just look real quickly there at verse 13. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So according to the Bible, we should be hating evil. We shouldn't be loving it or promoting it or just, well, it's just one day a week or it's just kind of fun or it's in jest or it's in fun. If you hate something, you really shouldn't be joining yourself in any way, shape, or form to it. Now, if you can't say that that there's, if you could just look at me in the face and say, Pastor Burzens, there is nothing evil about Halloween. I don't know what ha- what Halloween you're talking about. I mean, seriously. Let let's just use real simple intuition here. When you drive around and you see the images of like bloody butcher cleavers and you know people hanging from trees the ghosts the goblins the witches the devils the you know whatever now look i know that halloween also has many other people and characters and things and people like to dress up we'll get into the dressing up part in a little a little bit later in the sermon but just on the surface i mean if you just were to think just someone just says, hey, what do you think about Halloween? What pops up into your head? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, death, right? There's going to be darkness. It's going to be 
just evil things, scary things, fear, right? I mean, all of these things are very tightly associated with Halloween. And we're going to see what the Bible says about many of these different aspects. And then hopefully you can see, be like, yeah, you know what? This is something I really ought not to participate in and, and just uh, change, right? If it's something you've been planning or something you've been doing, maybe you can see like, yeah, this isn't the best thing. But let's, let's dig into the word of God here. Look down there at the last two verses of Proverbs 8. Now, in the context, just so we're clear, this section of, of Proverbs 8 is a personification of just of wisdom. So it, it's speaking about wisdom as if wisdom is like a person, okay? And I'm looking for verse 12. So before we get down to the last few verses, it, it says, I, wisdom... Dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty invention. So, I, wisdom, is, is like wisdom taking on a first person that's talking about me. I'm wisdom. And then, by me, kings reign, verse 15, verse 16, by me. So, you see, it's a personification of wisdom. And, and it stays this way in context. You can check it out later. All the way through to the last two verses where it says, For whoso findeth me findeth life. Hey, if you find wisdom you will also find life. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And when you, when you find that wisdom, you'll find life. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And, and finding the truth, finding that wisdom will also help you to find life. Whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. And look at that last phrase, all they that hate me love death. So everyone that hates the wisdom, hates the instruction, hates to hear about these things of God and doesn't want to have that true wisdom from the word of God, the Bible says that they love death. Because these two are opposites from each other. You, you know, obviously life and death are extreme opposites. But the people that hate wisdom, they love death. And what we see is a glorification of death and kind of a, of a love for death during this time of Halloween. I think it's pretty clear that it's not something we should be involved. But let's keep looking at some other examples here. I'm going to read for you from Isaiah 28. You could turn there if you'd like. Isaiah chapter 28. We see examples of people here who I, I think we could probably say you've also had experiences with a similar type of a person that downplays the gravity or seriousness of hell and will often use it as to be like something cool, right? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. There's people who are like, oh, man, yeah, I'm not going to heaven. I'm going to hell, <laughs> right? And you can just kind of imagine maybe like a burly man with a lot of tattoos and a beer in his hand just going like, I'm going to, I'm going to reign with, with Satan in hell, right? You have people that, want, that are really full of pride and, and kind of have this attitude as if, like, it's no big deal or, you know, even in, I mean, you've got, you know, hell's angels, right? Like, like people who just think it's really cool, or really bad, man, I'm, you know, and, and all variety of that where people just kind of think there's like this cool aspect of hell. And the Bible actually talks about some people that have a similar mindset that there's, you know, nothing's new. There's, there's no new thing under the sun. People are people and people have been you know, kind of the way they are forever, right? The, the human nature, our flesh, hasn't changed over the thousands of years that we've been in existence here, that, that the flesh still causes us to sin and people still have a lot of the same stupid thoughts that we've always had, right? Look at verse number 14 of Isaiah 28. The Bible says, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. So he's specifically talking to the rulers that were scornful men. Verse 15 says, Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves so they think that they're fine with their agreement with hell, that they're, that they're somehow hiding and they're able to tell lies and no one's going to catch them and that they know they're doing evil and that they're still going to not have to receive any judgment whatsoever. 
and they're actually embracing this, their own wickedness, and thinking that, like, hey, we, we've already made a deal with the devil, right? We're at agreement with hell. We made a covenant with death, okay? We're good on that front. We don't need to worry about anything. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, verse 16, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. God's saying you, you, your, your agreement with hell is no good. It's void. It's null and void. It doesn't stand. It has no standing whatsoever. And, you know, I, I think we could see this as people. Now, this is really wicked people, right? And I'm not saying if you celebrate Hall Halloween, you're a really wicked person like this person. What I'm, what I'm saying here, the point I'm trying to draw here is that these people have no problem with hell and they have no problem referencing death, you know, like none of this stuff. Hey, we're not going to be affected by this and we're going to lie our way out of it and no one's going to catch us. And God's saying, no, there's judgment coming. You know, the Bible says that fools make a mock at sin and fools also make a mock at God's judgment and God's punishment. You know, there's a lot of people, the Bible tells us, warns us in the last days, there's going to be uh, scoffers and people who are mocking the return of Jesus Christ and, you know, just saying, well, where is the coming of the Lord? You know, all things basically are, are the same as they always have been. So, so where is he? When's he coming back? And, and they have this kind of pompous attitude, an arrogant attitude of just thinking that the Bible's false and that, there is going to be no judgment day. And that, of course, is another foolish concept. But, the, you know, this, this mindset of just being good with hell, with death, and that it's not a big deal is a foolish mindset to have. Turn, if you would, to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read for you from Hebrews chapter 2. Because not only is hell obviously a big deal, and I don't think there's that much representation specifically of hell in Halloween. I mean, there may be some in some movies or something like that, but that's not the most uh, obvious thing. But there's definitely strong references to devils or Satan himself or things like that. I mean, that is just kind of goes hand in hand with Halloween. And Satan or devils are real creatures. Like they do exist. It's, this, this, isn't, this isn't just a fairy tale. It's not even just like some parable. It's real. Like, like angels exist. Devils exist. They are real creatures, real beings that the Bible tells us about and not something that we should be playing around with either and, and you know, tossing out even and, and in any way trying to make them somehow cool or anything like that, right? That's when you understand this, the, the gravity, gravity and seriousness, this is something that we should never want to put in a good light. But what, oh, there was a, I don't know if it's still on the air. It's, it's been a while now. I heard about a show, I think it's called Lucifer. Yep. Does, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I've, I've ne just full disclosure, I've never seen this show. I've just saw that it's, that it's was airing or something. I might've seen a little advertisement or something for it. And correct me if I'm wrong, for the, if any of you have seen it, doesn't it kind of put Lucifer in like a not so bad light where it, it's sort of showing you how like Lucifer works? And, and see, here's what Luciferians do. There's, there's literally people who worship Satan and they're Luciferians and they, they'll tell you that, no, Satan was actually a good guy. See, he, he was convincing Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge, right? The knowledge is a good thing. And the Bible even says that knowledge is a good thing. So he was just trying to help them out when he had them sin against God and receive the wages of their sin. I mean, that's, it, it's, so, it's so backwards mindset, but this is what Satan wants you to think that he's actually a good guy, right? I mean, that's what he desires. So he loves it when people are able to, to put up images and, and say that, oh, this is, you know, that, that whatever the TV show, and again, I haven't seen the show, but it, it, I've seen the push from many people to try to, to make it not be like so, you know, such a big deal. I'm going to read for you from Hebrews chapter 2, 
Verses 14 and 15, the Bible reads, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Talking about Jesus Christ. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So Satan has the power of death. And of course, Jesus Christ came to destroy him that has the power of death and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Of course, we know Jesus Christ came to deliver us from our sin, to deliver us from bondage, to deliver us from death and hell. And that's what Jesus came to do. Satan is that angel. He is that fallen angel that, that, that has the power of death and has brought people into bondage through fear of death and, and has made them subject to that bondage. That is not anything we should ever be putting in a positive light or a positive spin, even for one day. Or poking fun at, or just, oh, ha, 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 it's not that big of a deal, whatever. I'm just going to put an image of Satan on my door or whatever. Or scare myself by watching movies about Satan or something, you know? Like, we're, if you're a believer, you've been saved from that bondage and you've been saved from that fear. And that's not a good thing to be subjecting yourself to anyways. Why don't you uh, just rejoice through the deliverance that Jesus Christ offers? Look at verse number 20. I had you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse number 20, the Bible says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Now, again, full disclosure, I, just, I want people to understand what we're looking at. As we jump around from passage to passage, you understand the full context here. This is talking about eating foods offered uh, as a sacrifice to idols, okay? But I'm going to show you that I think it's fair to make an application to the celebration of Halloween for the same reasons that you wouldn't be partaking in eating food that's offered to, as sacrifice to devils. We also shouldn't be partaking in any of the celebratory as aspects of devils themselves, Okay, I, I think that's not a very far stretch, but just so you know, I'm not trying to say, oh, this is just talking about how, no, it's not. This is talking about food offered and sacrificed to idols, but let's see what it says. It says I, I say that the things that, which a Gentile sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And look, those people, they don't think that they're offering to devils. Just so you know, I mean, it, they have their own gods, their own religions, just as people today uh, don't think that they're, serving false gods if they're lighting candles to to buddha or whoever you know anything to that effect they think they're worshiping god you know the hindus they think they're worshiping god the the the, the, the muslims they think they're worshiping god. all these different groups think they're worshiping god but the bible's clearing it up and saying no it's actually devils that they're offering sacrifices to and as believers you should you know the truth about this Right? Now, they don't know the truth about this, but as a believer, you're different. You know the truth. And that's why, as a believer, you know, the world's going to do what the world does. I'm not saying we could just cancel Halloween altogether, but for Christians, we should not be participating. We're supposed to be sanctified, separated, and, and called out, and, and be different from the world. He says, and, and I would not, there in verse 20, the second half, I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All, and look at verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And this is another principle that I think we can apply as well to Halloween. Now, in the context here, why is he saying all things are lawful for me? Because if you literally just eat food that was sacrificed, like it's just food, like it's, it's explained elsewhere in scripture, we know that the idol's nothing, and we know that the food is just food, right? Like the food hasn't changed, it hasn't morphed into anything else. And if you're hungry and you want to eat some food, you can eat food, right? But you refrain or abstain from eating the foods offered to sacrifice to idols for the conscience of the other people who actually think it is a thing that's offered in sacrifice to that idol. So you don't want to give any credibility to that offering and, and to, to, 
you know, reinforce that person's mind of you say, oh, well, I know this guy's a believer, but he doesn't seem to have a big deal with this, so great, it must be okay then. When, in fact, it's not, right? We should have no fellowship with the devils, the food, you know. So we just say, look, I can, I can, you know, all things are lawful for me. I've already been saved from the curse of the law, but all things are not expedient. It's not the best thing to do. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And when it comes to our spiritual walk with Christ, with the Lord, you know, we ought to be above reproach. And we ought to remember that, like, you know, if, if I know that, like, we're not worshiping devils, we're not doing this other stuff, but I'm just going to dress my kids up in, in something benign or whatever, and, and then we're just going to go. But then just, like, fully participate in the rest of what everyone else is doing when you've got plenty of other people doing all these wicked things, it's kind of like, look, is that really expedient? Is that really edifying for people to be seeing you engaged in the whole event itself, right? In the whole holiday, as it's called. It's an unholiday. It's a you know, holiday short for holy day. It's not a holy day. Amen. It's an unholy day. But turn if you go to Ephesians chapter 5. So you know, we're kind of looking at this from a few different angles. People know you're a Christian. You're, you ought to hold yourself to a higher standard. The Bible holds you to a higher standard. Unto whom much is given shall much also be required, the Bible says. And if you, the more knowledge you have, the more understanding you have, God's going to expect more out of you. And as someone who's already had your sins forgiven and purged, and Jesus Christ had to shed his blood and die on the cross to pay for your sins, we ought to treat that with reverence and respect also, and care enough to say, man, this is, that's, sin is not a good thing in any way, shape, or form. Amen. I mean, look what Jesus had to go through. And thank God he did go through for that, and he loved us enough to do that. But, but why would we want to, seeing what the result is of that sin and knowing what the result is, you know, seeing it through faith, understanding what Christ went through, you know, we don't want anyone else to have to be brought into that bondage or uh, to make people think that that's somehow not a big deal when, you know, a lot of this stuff on the surface, some of it might not seem like a big deal, but at the end of the day, you want to get yoked up together with all of these things and, and put off the representation that, yeah, it's really not a big deal when people are going out and, and, and getting themselves involved in all this other nonsense. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 6. Because I would say this, that Halloween is, is also a, a holiday of darkness and not light. I mean, that's why you have all the black stuff and the spiders and the spiders, you know, just things in the dark. The Bible says, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We shouldn't be walking like we're in the darkness still. We shouldn't be exalting the darkness, but rather exalting the light. We're supposed to walk as children of light. Verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Is Halloween about goodness and righteousness and truth? I mean, honestly, no. Verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, which is what we should always be doing, prove Prove all things and prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Show that they're wrong, that we shouldn't have this fellowship with darkness. We're supposed to be children of light and exposing the darkness for what it is and having no fellowship with the darkness. Verse 12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. As believers, we ought to be celebrating the victory over death. Instead of celebrating death and, and getting involved in this, this darkness and the death, hey, there's many places, and I'll just blow through some of these for sake of time. Turn, if you would, to um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Bible says in Psalm 116, verses 3 and 4, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, 
deliver my soul. And of course, that salvation comes from the sorrows of death and the pains of hell. Those things are not things to be, you know, commemorized as good things. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me it hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And this is one of my favorite soul winning verses. This is actually my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Because it's, it's so simple, showing that, hey, if you believe on him, you, you have everlasting life. Present tense, you have it right now. Amen. You don't have to wait until your body dies to get it. You have it right now. In the future, you shall not come into condemnation. But you know what? Why? Because you've passed already. It's already done. It's a done deal. You've passed from death unto life. And if you're born again, look, you've passed from death unto life. Leave that death behind. Don't be celebrating that death and, and, and dying in darkness. Be promoting and exalting life. That's what we should be doing and getting excited about and preparing for. I mean, all this preparation of all the darkness and all the, you know, wicked things, dark things. We should never be spending our time doing that. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, the Bible says, So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? That's the victory over death and hell and our full ultimate salvation, even of our bodies, when the Lord comes back. And, you know, this is the mindset that we ought to have as believers. Now, this fascination with fear that many people have, and it's, it seems to be emphasized in Halloween with the haunted houses and the scary movies and things like that, is also not something that we should be uh, participating in as believers. It's not an area that you ought to be trying to make yourself fearful. Fear, unless you're fearing the Lord, is actually sinful. We shouldn't be afraid of everything. We're commanded not to fear. We're supposed to fear not what man can do unto you. We're not supposed to fear the things even that Satan or the devils can do unto us. We're not supposed to be afraid because we're supposed to have our full confidence and trust in the Lord, in Jesus Christ. We have our full confidence and we have no reason to fear. But the only fear we should have is a fear of the Lord, right? So that when we fail, we could be, we're, when we're chastised of the Lord, obviously that's something that we should be fearful of. But from anyone or anything else, we ought to have no fear. Now, look, none of us are perfect. I'm not saying that, like, I just walk and every single day of my life I never have any fear. I'm not making that claim. Okay, but what I'm not going to do is intentionally try to put myself into fear and, you know, love the adrenaline rush or whatever that comes from being scared and, and being put into fear. It's not an exercise that I believe we ought to be doing. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, and many of you that go out soul winning use this verse. I use this verse a lot to show people the, you know, how, how really any sin is worthy of a punishment of hell. Because not everyone believes that or understands that. Revelation 21, 8 is a great verse that lists off many different things so that uh, people could understand, look, it's not just murderers and rapists that deserve to go to hell. It's literally anyone who commits any sin that, that earns that punishment of hell. And that's often why we go to Revelation 21 8, but the very first words there, as it lists off these various things of people that will have their part in the lake of fire, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But it starts off saying, but the fearful. The fearful have their place in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Now, obviously, we're not those things if you've already accepted Christ and you've been washed of all of those sins. God doesn't view you as fearful, as abominable, as a sorcerer, as a liar, as any of these things because you have been washed, you've been sanctified, like 1 Corinthians 6 says, you've been justified. So Christ has made you clean. Christ has made that to be washed away from your account so that God doesn't see those things about you. But anyone who's not saved, of course, all of these things, you could have any one of these things on this list and, and you are deserving of that lake of fire. And fearful is on that list, showing us that, hey, being fearful like that is a sin. 
And I had you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7. The Bible says this, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So that's not from God. When you get fearful, that's not of God. What spirit has he given us? But of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what God gives you. God gives you power. God gives you love. And God gives you a sound mind, a clear mind, a rational mind. Those things come from God. Those are all good things that ought to be exalted, not the fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus abolished death. Amen. Let's not glory in death. Turn if you to Deuteronomy chapter 18. And I frequently will preach kind of once a year on Halloween, not necessarily every single year, but as our church grows, I just want to make sure people understand why we take this stand. Because it's also important, it's just as a side note in general, and look, you know, families, parents with kids, it's important to understand why we believe what we believe. You should always know why. Why is it that we believe what we believe? It's not enough for kids just to grow up with the rules but then they're never instructed, well, why is that rule even in place? Oh, yeah, we don't celebrate Halloween. Yeah, but why don't we celebrate Halloween? You know, understand these things because, you know, there's other people who, you know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, that, well, they don't celebrate, like, anything. But it's like, well, why, though? And then, and then you know, we don't want to get lumped in with, oh, yeah, you're just like the Jehovah's Witnesses. No, we're not, actually. We're, not, we're nothing like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, they happen to get that one right about not celebrating Halloween, but they don't even celebrate birthdays and stuff, and that's just, just weird, right? Like it, we're not, um, it, It's not like we're irrational or unreasonable with this stuff. We need, to, we need to reason through the scriptures, but it's kind of like if you see, you know, it, it, it just it, it seems like it should be so obvious to me, and I think it is, but some people don't like just accepting what's obvious oftentimes because for whatever reason you like it you look i grew up celebrating halloween as a kid every year i'd go out get dressed up go trick-or-treating and all of that so i like i understand what it's about is in general right like i know what we did all i'm saying is that a believer and a christian shouldn't shouldn't have participation in that because of all the, the overarching theme of halloween itself without even having to go back to the origins and Sam Hain and all this other stuff, right? Because obviously things can change over time. And, you know, some people tell us, well, you shouldn't be celebrating Christmas and you shouldn't be celebrating Easter and all this other stuff. But it's like, look, we shouldn't be celebrating Santa Claus. But is there anything wrong with celebrating the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ? Like, like I just say, is there really anything wrong with picking a day out of the year and saying, hey, we are going to, even if it was some, you know, some other people celebrated something else on that day, so what? I mean, find a day where you can't find someone who celebrated something wicked on that day. I mean, good luck. There's been a lot of civilizations, a lot of cultures all throughout history have done different things. So if we're literally celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, I don't see how there's a problem with that. Okay, same thing with celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, it's not about the bunnies and the eggs and all that stuff. It's about Christ. So those are not things that we should just like, oh man, I can't, I can't worship or I can't uh, participate. Look, it's, it doesn't have, a, Christmas isn't just decorating a bunch of skulls. Okay, Christmas isn't like, you don't just see people hanging up ghouls and goblins on Christmas. Does it make sense? Right? You see where you could like, kind of draw the line and use uh, rationality to, to look at the scripture and be like, look, if the Bible's saying over and over and over again, all these various things that literally embody Halloween as a whole, maybe we should have nothing to do with it. Proverbs 23, 4, I, I love this, or not Proverbs, Psalms. Psalm 23, right? Famous passage. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. As this is one more verse, just kind of giving more insight into fearfulness being a sin. And that, hey, look, we have no reason to fear. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Amen. I'm not going to fear any evil, right? I'm not going to be afraid of that. And we shouldn't be afraid, and, and we shouldn't try to make ourselves be afraid of the evil either. Deuteronomy 18. So what else goes on on Halloween? There's, you know, trick-or-treating, and I preached this in the past before, which, again, it, it's kind of, I, I consider that a minor thing. Like, there's so many things that, that they may seem pretty little in the grand scheme of things, but we ought to still take a look at it and think about it. I mean, I, and, you know, things have changed, cultures have changed, but trick-or-treat, like, you got to think, why do people even say that? Well, trick-or-treat it literally, it's saying, you, what do you, you choose? Do you want to give me a treat or do I give you a trick? Right? Am I going to do something to you for not giving me what I want? Now, I know in our culture today, the kids aren't literally like extorting people. <laughs> but that's where it comes from. Right. And, and it is what it means. <laughs> right? Just because you're not, just because you're not putting any force behind that statement, right? As a kid, like, you're still you're still being taught. Hey, you give me a treat, or I'm going to give you a trick. Like that's that is that has an effect overall. It, it may be subconscious, it may be subtle, but it's something that look. If we love the truth and we love righteousness, we should avoid that stuff. Which, by the way, is also why I am completely against and I preach against the Santa Claus stuff and uh, at Christmas time, I think, this is, I think this is even worse than the trick-or-treat is, well, if you're not good, then you don't get any gifts. Because if we're going to celebrate anything about Christmas, it should be that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners and that salvation is a free gift. Right? So when we celebrate a holiday and you give gifts to people because you love them, it, is, it should never imply your work has to be good enough for me to give you a gift. That is not what we want to teach our children. Because if we're going to teach them that at the time of the year that we're celebrating our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's birth, if, if, if that's tied in together, but then we're also teaching them, well, if I'm not good enough, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to get the gift. You are literally teaching them a works-based salvation subtly. You're teaching them that works have to be involved in order for you to receive a free gift. But no, my friend, salvation is completely free. It has nothing to do with your good works whatsoever. You don't have to be good enough for God to give you the gift of salvation. And we should never be trying to teach our kids that way at all. Look, parents, I understand to, to have that little carrot to dangle out in front of your kids to make them to try to do good things so that your life could be a little bit easier but don't do that. Not, not, definitely not at Christmas, not with, the, with the, the thing of a gift, okay? How about you just use a punishment instead? If you want your children to obey you, just say, look, obey or else, <laughs> right? There's, there are consequences for your actions. And that goes year round, not just around Christmas. But at Christmas, I'm going to tell you that I love you because I do love you. And at Christmas, we're going to celebrate what Jesus did for us. And how are we going to celebrate that? Well, oftentimes, it's through giving gifts to each other. Amen. We love what Christ did. We love our family. So we're going to give the gift. And even if you weren't that good this year, I still love you. And I'm going to give you a free gift. It's still available to you. Good. 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 So, I mean, you see how these things are somewhat similar, right? The trigger... trigger we don't want to go down that mindset and have that be an influence in our life. And there's so many things out there in this world that are like that. There's so many things. Like we're inundated with this stuff all the time. But if we're, if we're treating things seriously as we should and always scrutinize and look at our life, now look, I'm not saying this to beat anybody down, but just to have a little bit more insight and knowledge and to think about it a little bit and say, hey, and if you, if you determine that, that, you know what, I think Pastor Bruce may be honest on the air, I think this may be right, then praise the Lord, you'll change, do something different. That's a, the whole purpose of these sermons is to, is to just open up your eyes a little bit and maybe think about things that 
you probably hadn't thought about. I never thought about why do we celebrate Halloween as a kid because it was just done. It was just something from the time I was born that like you just did. You just do it. Why? Because everybody does it. Was that a good reason to do something? Just because everybody does it? That's what a lot of kids say about a lot of dumb things and a lot of sins. Well, everybody was drinking. Everybody was smoking. Everybody was, you know. Yeah, kids are impressionable that way. With parents, let's not continue that. Well, just everyone's doing it. And even church, we'll go to church. Well, just because everyone's doing it. No, that's not why we go to church. That's not why we do what's right. And explain why do we do these things. They have a good reason for it. So trick-or-treating, and then, and then you know, ghosts and spirits and things like that that are often, again, go hand-in-hand hand with this. Deuteronomy 18, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Now, I'm not going to go in depth on all definitions of these things. If you don't know what they are, you can look them up later. But they all have to do with, with the spirits and the, the ghosts and the devils and, the, and this type of thing. Okay, This is what that's all about. And the Bible saying, look, the people of the land, the Canaanites, they were doing all this stuff. Like this, this was normal for them. But I don't want you to learn their ways. Don't be like them. These things are wicked. This should not be among you talking to his people. Look, this is not for you. You shouldn't have these people among you. This isn't something that you should play around with or think it's not that big of a deal. They all did this and I got angry and that's why they're not in this land anymore. Verse 12 says, For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Not suffered thee so to do means he hasn't allowed it. He's not allowing you to do it. Okay, He's saying don't learn their ways. Don't do and we could do the same thing today. Don't learn the ways of the unbelievers when it comes to celebrating death, when it comes to celebrating Halloween. Just don't learn those ways. Don't participate in those ways. It's, those are not for us. It's not for the children of light. And the last place I'll be turned is Proverbs chapter 3. One other aspect, of course, I said I would get to this later, is dressing up, right? Dressing up as whatever. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong in general with people dressing up in costumes and playing around or whatever. I mean, my kids have different costumes. They'll play in some from time to time and, and, and just have fun, you know, in just whatever. Like I, one of them had like a mouse costume or something like that where they just goof around, right? So it's not that, that the reason why Halloween's wrong is because people dress up in costumes. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, it's everything else. It's the more important things, all the, the fear and the death and everything else. But there is problems with, with some of the things that people do dress up as anyways. I mean, you could say, well, what if my kid dresses up like a, I don't know, I mean, showing my age a little Power Ranger or something, you know, what, like just something like, who cares? Captain America, whatever, right? Like, like I'm not saying that that's just, that's just some horrible thing. But when you think about a lot of the things that people do dress up as, I mean, just even historically, I'm sure even to this day, there's a lot of, a lot of and, and, and it's getting worse and worse, especially among like adults that celebrate Halloween. It gets really weird. And you get, you get a lot of immodesty and dressing up as devils and, and everything else. Like it, it gets pretty bad. And I think one of the worst things, and people will say it's okay, even if it's just for a day, is when the people cross dress. And you got a woman that wants to dress up like a man character of something or some movie or whatever, and then a, or a man that wants to dress up like some type of a woman when the Bible teaches very clearly Whoa. that all that do the, you know, when, it, when a, 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 a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, neither shall a man wear a woman's garment for all that do show are, are abomination unto the Lord thy God. It's abominable for 
men and women to cross-dress. I mean, it's what the Bible says. And, and that, again, that ought to be something that's apparent, but in our crazy, weird, twisted world today, everything's just becoming acceptable and normal, or at least that's what they're trying to push it as. But all the more reason we need to be not just so flippant about everything. Oh, what's a big deal? Oh, what's a big deal? Oh, what's a big deal? What's a big deal? Well, it is a big deal. When God says something is abominable, you better believe that's a big deal. And we ought to have a higher standard in view that says, look, no sin should just be trifled with or played with as it's not a big deal. All sin is a big deal. All of it is. So why would we want to in any way associate ourselves with something sinful? We should be striving to live a life that's pleasing to God in all that we do every day. We should be able to ask ourselves every single day, would God be pleased with me today? The things that I did, when I went to work, the conversations that I had, whatever I spent my time doing, is God pleased with what I did today? And I think that's a, you know, a, a, an appropriate way as believers. We ought to be thinking and saying, hey, today, what, you know, the things that I did today, is God pleased with that? The way that I'm raising my children, is God pleased with that? The way that I'm teaching them, the way that I'm instructing them, is God pleased with that? Whatever I do on the job, is God pleased with that? The conversations I have, is, it, is God okay with that? And we know there's going to be plenty of times where we should be able to say, yeah, you know what, he's not. Because we're not perfect. But just because we're not perfect, it's not an excuse to just say, well, whatever. Right, right. No, I mean, your heart needs to be right and just continually working to try to improve, to live separated, to live sold out, to live for the Lord. And to me, a real easy place to start is just like, you know what, October 31st is going to come and go, and I'm not going to have anything to do with that. In fact, I'm going to come to the chili cook-off and we'll have a good time here. We'll, we'll praise God and, and just enjoy some just wholesome fun and enjoying each other's act, uh, uh, presence. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, verse number 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fear God. Depart from evil. Let's not have anything to do with the evil. Let's not glorify the evil. Just stay away from the evil. You know, we live in this world, but we're, we're not supposed to be of this world. We are supposed to be different. You know what? You may be made fun of. People say, oh, yeah, oh, this person doesn't celebrate Halloween. Can you believe that? So what? Yeah. So what? If someone wants to mock you and ridicule you because you don't want to go and worship Satan on a day, then whatever. They could mock you and ridicule you. Okay? If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? And that's what Jesus said about himself because people were saying that the works that he did were after Beelzebub. When he was casting out devils, he'd, he'd cast out devils in the name of Satan. And he's saying, look, if they're saying that stuff about me, you better believe they're going to say that stuff and more about you. And whatever, right? Let them believe whatever they think. What matters more to you? Does it matter more what man thinks about you or does it matter more what God thinks about you? And that's all I encourage you to do is to take a healthy look at Scripture and say, is participating in this day that's coming up, is, would God be pleased with me? Or is God not going to care? Now look, uh, this is my last point. We don't have a rule in this church that says you cannot go and celebrate Halloween. Okay? We don't make those kinds of rules for you. That's weird. That's a little cultish. Okay, You choose whatever you want to do with your time and your life. And if I haven't been convincing to you today and you think, I still don't think there's any problem with this, then go ahead and do whatever you're going to do. Okay, I'm not going to endorse it, but I'm also not going to look down on you, when you if you come back to church next week and you come to hear more of the Word of God either. Right? You choose to do what you're going to do. That is not some sin that's like going to get you kicked out of church. Right? If you want to know what that is, read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 because there still is a standard in church. And 1 Corinthians chapter 5 outlines that, okay? 
but you decide for yourself. Does it make sense or not? And, and at the end of the day, too, there's, just like, there's so many little things in the Bible, I think, are kind of like people freak out over and want to make a big deal out of it. But is it really a big deal? Like one day out of the year, you just change. Like, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. Is it really that big of a deal? Like the Bible talks about men with long hair and women, or, yeah, men are not supposed to have long hair. Like, is it really that big of a deal just to get a haircut? Whatever, right? Like, like these are things that you should just be able to easily just check out. Be like, oh, uh, if this is going to make God angry, then I just won't do that. Amen. Like, no problem. Done. And even if you're uncertain, you know, just err on the side of caution. That's what I, that's what I try to do, at least. I mean, I, again, I'm not perfect, but it's like, if I'm still kind of up in the air, I'm like, yeah, I don't really know if this is right. I don't know if I should be doing this. I don't know if God's going to be happy with this. Then just don't do it. I mean, at the end of the day, what are you really sacrificing? A bag of candy? <laughs> Go to the store after Halloween. <laughs> you could get a really good deal on some candy if you want the candy. And then you don't have to participate in the rest of it, right? That's it. And, and if it really is that big of a deal to you, talk to me. Maybe I could get some candy for you, okay? If that's gonna, if that's gonna be the big deal breaker for you, or, or how about this? How about this? Hey, bring someone to church next week, and I'll give you this. And look, people, this is good stuff, okay? But this is not being handed out at most doors on Halloween. This is way better than the double bubble, all right? It's way better than the, the I don't even know what, the, the, a Tootsie Roll, okay? Way better. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, uh, for this church and for everyone here today, dear Lord, and I pray that you would please uh, bless our church. Lord, help us to, to be able to look at your word and analyze our own life against what your word says. Lord, help us to be able to apply the, the truths from Scripture and to do so without clouded judgment, Lord, even if there's something that we may enjoy or like in this world. If, it's, if it becomes evident to us through your word that it's not something that would be pleasing to you, Lord, help us just to be able to, to eliminate those things. Lord, open up our understanding from your word so we can make more applications day to day, that we can be confident that, that as we go about our daily lives that we're, we're doing things that are pleasing in your sight, Lord. We do love you. Please uh, help us as we endeavor to, to continue to strive against sin. And Lord, please help us this afternoon. We go out and try to preach your word and, and lead other people to Christ. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.